Hi everyone, as you can see, just practicing the guitar and I'm not that good at it. I'll tell you why, because I managed to break it this evening over here and very interesting. I haven't played in such a long time, but very interesting talking about guitar, talking about rock and roll friends. We have found out in the last 48 hours that the famous band Oasis have actually reformed over here. And this was a huge, huge news because I think they were about to release a record, re-release it. 30 years after it was originally released, they were planning to release it. And at the same time over here, they have actually reunited at the same time to do concerts all over, I think, Europe or the United Kingdom. And it sent shockwaves all over the UK, all over Europe, all over many fans. First things first, I'm going to say is actually interesting enough. I remember when I was in Yeshiva, I think back in the year 2007, 2008, I had a roommate. I think he was actually from Texas. And I think this band Oasis was playing in Texas. So he flew all the way from Israel, all the way to Texas to go to the concert and then came all the way back two, three days later. I think he had other issues why he was going back at that point in time. Bit as may, he went for the concert. I think they split up shortly after that point in time. But is it a big deal at everything else? It's seemingly for a lot of people out there, it is a huge deal because the country went in uproar. It's made the headlines in all newspapers. They're, they're saying, saying that even before the tickets are released, according to some of the news press, the amount of cost it is, if you want to stay in a hotel near these venues where they haven't even released the t- tickets yet, are going to be six, seven hundred pounds at the time of the concert. And it hasn't even been released yet. That's an incredible thing about it over here. But it got me thinking over here. What can we learn from it? Because back in the day, I was a huge, huge fan of theirs. I remember especially in the 19, mid-1990s, early 2000s, when they were really huge. I had all their records, pretty much all their albums. I was like really, really into them. The whole country was into them. I remember in 1997 alone, I think they had the fastest ever selling album and there were people queuing up in the night, in the, all overnight to just get this record. And it was all over the, there was hype in the TV, in the media and everything else just for this record over here. And I was listening to a uh, podcast yesterday on this specific topic itself. Why are people so happy about it? It's not just, let's say they're reforming over here, this music band is over here. It's to do with all the nostalgia because all these people that were really into this band, let's just say, in the 90s, in the 2000s, whatever it might be, a lot of their songs, because a lot of pa- very, very powerful other songs are very, some of the songs have meaningful lyrics, very popular tunes. They associate what they did during that time period because of those songs. So the emotion is not coming because they're coming and reforming and doing these concerts again, because there's a lot of emotional baggage for these people because of what they're doing in this life. And there's one of these concepts, actually, in Judaism, uh, the great uh, thinkers actually used to do hit bodadut, where we reflect on everything that we have done over the last week, over the last month, over the last year. That's an opportune time when you come into Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, in the month of El, where we reflect on everything we've done on this year. Have we achieved what we want to do? Were we great? Did we wrong any people and stuff like that? But this hit brother Dut hit people yesterday, let's just say. This reflection all of a sudden it really, really hit probably many middle-aged men in the United Kingdom and all over Europe and possibly all over America because they really, at that time period, it was such a powerful time. The, the music was really that good from a secular point of view. The tunes were really that good. They were really catchy. The lyrics in many of the songs had like a lot of meaning to it. Over here. Like you, you have the records over there. A lot of the songs, especially the earlier ones, especially in the first two albums over there, they had good meaning. Obviously, I think it veered off afterwards and the lyrics didn't become as good, didn't have as much meaning. Maybe it was more violent lyrics as the albums came on, which obviously we don't necessarily support. But in the, oh, those earlier albums, there was meaning in some of the words. I'm not recommending anyone that uh, to actually listen to it now, especially if one is learning Torah and is into Jewish music, I wouldn't say give it, I mm-hmm. definitely now say a disclaimer not to give up on the Jewish music and keep listening to Jewish music and don't veer off to other forms. But you people like myself over here, what we grew up on this music and then we reflect because uh, for me, my visual memory in of itself is very, very strong. I've got a very, very good visual memory. My memory when it comes to learning text, 
let's say Jewish textual information is not necessarily as good. But when it comes to visual events, remembering things happen, remembering conversations, remembering people I met, I am like, I've got such a strong memory. And hence, everything that happened in the music sphere over those years in the late 90s, early 2000s, especially, where I was into this kind of music, I remember where I was when that song was released. I remember what I was doing. Was I doing GCSEs at that time? Was I doing A-levels at that time? Who was I friendly with at that point in time? Where did I go in those summers? I remember then everything that happened in those summers, in those events, they actually get recollected because just because of those music songs over there. So why? So it hit me over here. Why are these people so emotional? I thought to myself for a minute. Because of so much events actually took place during that point in time. The people aren't crying, let's say, that they got back together, how excited they are. They're crying because they remember all the other things that happened during that time period. And a lot of emotional things actually occurred for many of these individuals. Friends, I'll tell you one time I actually went to see them live. I was studying at the University of Liverpool. I went with another friend, I think in 2002, went to Wales. We actually went from Liverpool to Wales. I think it was a few hour journey. I think I took a bus actually. I didn't have a car at that stage in time. And I remember that night, it was a freezing, freezing night. I think it was in Cardiff. It was, it was like something else that night was. It was, it was never, never so cold. I was keeping kosher. The whole time I was in university, I grew up keeping kosher, thank God. And uh, it, I was very, very strict on that. And uh, that specific night, I remember, which I, uh, which obviously, not proud on uh, specific things. I think I was really, really, really hungry. And uh, yes, probably I should have bought something approved by the Kashrut department of the London Bet Din at the time. I didn't, I think we, I was with another friend and we, I bought, I bought the chips over there. I checked the ingredients and everything else that was funny enough. I wasn't necessarily religious at the time, but I wanted to be strict on Kashrut to some degree. And I think I bought, I, I just bought uh, chips over there. I checked the ingredients. It was all... It seemed okay. I'm not, I wasn't a rabbi at the time, so obviously you, you don't know what's going on inside the place itself. But I felt really, really, really guilty that night that I did it. I thought, you know, why am I buying this? You know, it's, uh, I could have bought a crisps or something like that. And there was that kind of regret from that specific night where I was there that day. Because obviously when one is going to buy food, one's got to make sure there's kashrut supervision, there's kashrut certificate, it's not open on Shabbat, there's many different laws, maybe we'll come into that. And that was a moment where I looked back on, you know, uh, connecting the band together to those live events, you know, I probably fell short on that specific moment in itself. This was 22 years ago at the time, and I was always strict on uh, eating, not eating out, and, uh, I, I, you know, it, in a way, because I grew up with it, you know, it was something that was a no-go zone. But all these events that happened when they released this song, that song, I, I remember it. I remember going to uh, youth events in the year 2000 when they released their fourth album. I remember the night when they released it. I remember having conversations with people who I might be friendly with on here even. And uh, this was back in uh, 24 years ago. I remember, all these things. I remember, I remember going to America in 2005, listening to their music. I remember being on Israel tour in 1999, having on uh, my cassette player at the time, listening to their music, driving through the Masada at the time, driving in Jerusalem just by myself on the bus in the corner and uh, enjoying it. All these memories, blasting it in the car while I was traveling in Liverpool. I I don't really listen to secular music, non-Jewish music anymore. For many, many years I haven't. I I try to listen to Jewish music. I'm going to listen to music. That's as a general thing. I enjoy listening to Jews, Jewish music now. I don't really enjoy secular music, but it hit me also. They got reunited together. They reformed. And then all those memories came back that he'd bought a dot. You know, it all, all of a sudden comes, what, what was I doing when I was 16, when I was 18, when I was 20? There's that emotional attachment from the music over there that will probably never go. And music is so powerful at the end of the day. That's why in many, especially in the North and African countries, we learn about a lot of the great poets Poets, there were the great literal poems they actually created there. There was rabbis out there that made thousands of poems. Some people would have even borrowed some of the non-Jewish tunes over there and converted into Jewish songs also. We see a lot of top Jewish songs out there that uh, borrowed, let's say, the tunes, the verses, the chords from some of these non-Jewish songs over the world. And I'll just leave with you on one point. I remember there was a music band I think there was a reality TV show or something like that where it was like a pop idol kind of thing they had back in the day. 
And I think the winners were, I can't remember the winners now, I think it was Hearsay. We're talking back 20, 24 years ago, something like that. I was in maybe high school and they won it. And I think they had a song which was copied exactly from all the Oasis songs. So they asked the front man of Oasis, I remember, Noel Gallagher, you, you could sue them. You, you possibly have got a libel case against this band over here. They, they've copied your song of the tune. It's so blatant. It's the same thing. So he even said himself, you know, I, th I think this is what he said was that, look, we took so many, borrowed so many chords, so many uh, tunes from so many other places. It's never going to end. The one person blames the other. So, you know, we've got all this music out there. You know, the main thing is that if we're listening to songs, if it's not necessarily Jewish songs, that it's got to have meaning. It's got to improve us as people or the songs that we're going to listen to. It's got to have emotion to it. Uh, it's got to, you know, connect people to things. It can't have bad lyrics and bad words. You've got to stay away from all those uh, kind of things. Any, you, you see some of the rap music nowadays, especially the, the language inside these songs are terrible. You go, I, you go inside the shopping mall and you can hear it over there. No meaning. It's just rude. It's just, it's terrible. It brings so much bad things. But when music has meaning at the end of the day, you know, that is very powerful and uh, very important also. So about what, what's actually interesting, I'm not quoting it, God forbid. We know inside the Torah and Torah and Nevi'im and Ketuvim, there are 10 songs inside the Torah itself. Mm -hmm. And then actually, Adam Arishan sang Mizmor Shil Yom HaShavat on the day of creation, as we learn, I think in the Midrashim, in Parashat Bereshit, at the start of Bereshit. We're coming in uh, to Hazinu soon in Sefer Devarim. That's a fourth prophetic song. Obviously, we see, sing every single day, the Az Yashir song of the Kriyat Yamsuf, when the sea was split and the miracles actually help for Am Yisrael. So my message to you is, you know, it's nice. These bands are reforming. This is reforming. It's nostalgia at the end of the day. But we should sing the song to Hashem every day of thanks and praise. That's why there's a, the Tehillim Psalm called Mizmor Toda. We should, I recommend everyone to learn about it, search it, and say it every day, and praise Hashem for everything. Bez Hashem, let's all sing together. Let's all sing to health, prosperity, brachot, and blessings. And let's sing together that we want the hostages to come home unequivocally, unconditionally. We want to sing together that we want all our heroic soldiers to uh, be safe and sound and hopefully no one's going to need to uh, fight in any army whatsoever we're going to have a Moshiach coming and the rebuilding of the third Bet HaMikdash Bim Hirav Amenu Akshav we want it now as they say the main song obviously the Lubavitchers will sing is we want Moshiach now we want Moshiach now we want Moshiach now we want Moshiach now so wishing all a fantastic night